everyone here and online. Welcome to the Habersham County primary debate. I'm Nora Almazan, reporter for Now Habersham. And I'm Jerry Nees, a reporter from Now Habersham. Early voting has started for the primary on May the 21st to determine who will be on the ballot in November. So we have eight county commissioner candidates, three of whom are incumbents, and we have four Board of Education candidates, two of whom are incumbents, that will follow after the commissioner's debate. Tonight is a critical test in who is best to represent you, the voters, in the day-to-day -day operations of our county and of our educational system. The commissioner candidates will discuss how best to lower property taxes to resolve a nearing capacity landfill how to handle an ever-expanding need for a new jail, and discuss sales taxes. The Board of Education candidates will discuss school safety, the success of all students, budgets, and how to prepare for the potential growth in our county. Now Habersham would like to thank our generous sponsors, Dockery Electrical Plumbing, Heating and Air, the Norton Agency, Piedmont University, McDonald and Cody, the Habersham County Republican Party, Northeast Georgia Signs, City of Demarest, and Oba Brazilian Cuisine. Let's meet the candidates for the Habersham County Commissioner debate. Bruce Palmer, District 1, Eric Holbrooks, District 1, Kelly Woodall, District 1. In District 4, Bruce Harkness, Wade Rhodes. In District 5, we have Ty Akins, Locke Arnold, and Gisela McGugan, who goes by Gigi, and we'll be calling her Gigi, but her name, Gisela, will be on the ballot like that. Um, our official time monitor is Demarest City Councilman Sean Allen, and he is the one who is going to hold up the yellow card for 10 seconds and the red card to stop. Jerry Neese will explain the rules. Good evening, candidates. You all should have the rules in your packet, but we're gonna go over them so that the audience and those online know uh, what the rules are for you all. Each candidate will have 30 seconds for an opening statement. Each candidate will have one minute to respond to questions. After each candidate has responded, to a question, each candidate will be allowed 30 seconds for rebuttal if needed, after all the candidates have answered the question. Be respectful, no personal attacks, stick to the facts and stay on topic. Moderators retain the right to cut off the microphones of candidates who do not follow the debate format or rules. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, this is your opportunity to convince the voters that you deserve to be elected. Let's begin now with opening statements. We will begin with District 1 and then followed by District 4 and then District 5. Let's begin with Commission Candidate Bruce Palmer. Good evening. I want to thank everybody for coming and giving uh, their time, first of all, to, to hear what we have to say as your candidates. Um, First of all, I'm Bruce Palmer. I'm a lifelong resident of Habersham County. I have four sons and four grandsons. My, kind of my, my reason for running initially was I've seen a lot of our children moving away and never coming back. So I want to try to work on Habersham County to be a place that our kids and grandkids can live, work, and raise a family right here. All right, we'll go to Eric Holbrooks in District 1. First of all, thank you all for uh, hosting this tonight, and uh, thank you all for coming, letting us uh, kind of tell you a little bit about ourselves. I'm Eric Holbrooks. I'm 46 years old. I come from a long line of Habersham Countyans. My wife, my children, and I work hard in our community. We love on and feed, on, feed the folks in Habersham every Thanksgiving, and we work at the Chattahoochee Mountain Fair Board and Association. I am an excavator advisory board member for Georgia 811, and we are very involved with our local swim team in the Aquatic Center. It's my hope to be the next commissioner for District 1. 
Next is Kelly Woodall with District 1. Thank you again for being here. And as I walked around the room and talked to you beforehand, I want to tell you that this process has been a joy for me. For 19 years, I've served in some capacity in this county, whether it's been on a board or an advisory board or a nonprofit. I love this community. But make no mistake, my identity is not in this position. It's in Christ. And whatever I do, I want at the end of the day, my identity to be clear. I love this community, but I love my Lord. And if you think I'm a conservative, you haven't heard the end of it. I'm not a go along to get along. I believe in a fiscal conservative values that will guide our county and keep us in the budget. We'll now move to District 4. Bruce Harkness with your opening statement. Hello, everybody. I'm Bruce Harkness. I currently serve as your commissioner, and I've been honored to serve you, and I want to continue to serve you. I want to be the taxpayer's bulldog. I want to fight for you. I want to fight for everybody. I don't care if you have $2 in your bank account or $2 million in your bank account. I want to fight for everybody. Everybody is somebody to me. Um, I ask for your vote tonight because I am a Christian, I'm conservative, and I'm a Republican, and I promise that I'll bring the um, working man's voice to this commission. Thank you. Now we go to Wade Rhodes. Uh, appreciate you being here tonight. This is a great crowd. This shows you care about your community. This is the kind of crowd we need at planning commission meetings. This is the kind of crowd we need at commission meetings. I spent 23 years running my own business since I was 23 years old. I sold that business in 1999. I've been in commercial real estate and development for the past 24 years for the Norton Agency. We are at a point where we have to come together, have a vision and a plan for what's at our border coming up from Hall County. I do not believe we're ready for that yet, and your voice needs to be heard on what you want and what you want it to look like, and that's why I'm running for this office. We go to District 5 now with Ty Aikens. Hey, uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Ty Aikens. I'm currently serving as uh, commissioner in District 5 and also currently serving as chairman. Um, I owned and operated a business in Haversham for about 22 years. We have my wife and I have five children and four grandchildren. And um, I just served a partial of the four-year term, three years. And so I feel like uh, we still got a lot of work to do and a lot of good things going on uh, and still a lot of things that we need to fix. And so I uh, appreciate everyone being here tonight. Thank you. Bye. Lock Arnold, you're next, sir, from District 5. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies go first always. I yield to the lady, please. I'll speak after her. Thank you, Mr. Lock. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, as I was introduced, you can call me Gigi. I'm running for Commissioner District 5. Uh, I'm a mom to three beautiful girls, and I have been married for 23 years. I have been living in Clarksville for the past almost seven years, and I love where I live. I love everything that we have, um, and I want to keep it that way. Um, I am also the vice chair of the library board here in Habersham County. I'm a teacher at Wilbanks Middle School. I've been a teacher for over two decades. And I am here because I am led and directed by God Almighty to be here and guide our county to better ways. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Arnold, you can go now. You might want it, you might need it, but we better figure out how we're gonna pay for it. My name is George Lock Arnold. I've been in business, in the welding business on the west side of Clarksville for 42 years. It takes money. The bills have to be paid. Hospital. It's not going to go away. You don't kick the can down the road. You don't do that. And that's, that's, it's been going on that way for years. We must address these problems and don't take a year, five years in doing it. I thank you all with your opening statements. Now we'll begin with the questions. Everyone sitting here tonight qualified as a Republican. What virtues and values as a Republican will you bring to the table in the public office you're running for? And we will begin the uh, answers now with uh, <clears throat> Bruce Palmer. Um, I think the Republican Party... Um, some may agree, some may disagree. Uh, I think there's more to being a conservative than spending today 
or what something costs today. I think we have to look at our community and our future and sometimes spending some money today will save us money in years to come. So I think we have to look at the big picture uh, as far as the conservative values um, is more than just today is my thing. Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, I've asked, I, I've been asked that several times um, why I choose Republican and conservative values. Number one, I don't have a choice. I live in a family, we live paycheck to paycheck. I have to conserve every dollar I can so that we can afford to do the things we want to do and, you know, pay for the things we have to. So being a conservative, to me, I mean, you you got to do it. There just ain't no other way. I don't make it doesn't make sense to take loans to pay loans. So that's that's my answer for that. Thank you, Kelly Woodall. As a conservative, I believe in limited government, limited taxes, and I believe in individual responsibility, individual freedom. I don't believe that government should be our first answer to any problem that we face. If you think more government is the solution to a problem created by the government, then you are on a different page. Our county has exceeded itself in taxes in the past five years, really in the past four, nearly doubling our tax burden on the citizens. The county has a limited revenue stream that we get to operate in, and I think that revenue stream was indicative of a county that believed that county government should not exceed its bounds. As a conservative, I believe with staying in the budget, I believe with partnering with private industry to do things that instead of hiring a, a new government employee. I think our county has lost sight of the fact that each one of us as property owners and as people who live in this county bear the burden for the decisions are made uh, to expand the, the number of people that are employed in the county, expand the, the number of services that are offered, and expand the budgets that are being uh, um, asked for us to fund. It is time to return to fiscally conservative values that are indicative of the Republican Party. Thank you, sir. We move now to Bruce Harkness. Hey, everybody. Um, I am a, con a conservative Christian Republican. Um, I was a Christian conservative Republican back in the day when it wasn't so cool to be a con Christian conservative Republican. But hey, I fought for the people here because I've always been a conservative. Big government is not the way. Bigger government is not the answer. Bigger government is not better government. I'm for smaller government. I'm for smaller taxes. Hey, I'm from the country, people. I believe in living within your means. If you can't live within your means, stop taxing these people out here, my fellow brothers and sisters in this community, to for bigger government. It's not right. It's immoral to tax the people in this county for bigger government. I'm not for bigger government. I'm not for more taxes. I have seven children and seven grandchildren. I'm worried about them every day. And I'm worried about you. I'm worried about your children, worried about your grandchildren and our future. And that's why I want to be your commissioner. Um, I believe that we have to control taxes, have to control spending. We have to control growth. Yeah, growth is coming, but we can control it. This commission here, we have the ability to control growth. And I ask for your vote. Wade Rhodes. Can't tell if that cut on. I've been a lifelong Republican. I believe in business. I believe in business principles. Um, less government is certainly a good thing. You, the government is a necessary object to law and order and rules and regulations, but I, I'm a firm believer that solutions to problems can be done with the business community. Uh, we do have some issues that we have to solve, one of them being the jail, one of them being the landfill. There are retired executives in this community that we need to pull from. We don't need to hire consultants from the outside to tell us how to fix our landfill or our jail. We need to use the people that have moved here who have the experience behind them to help us solve these problems. Um, I'm a firm believer in education. Uh, why do we want to build a, a jail for 240 beds? Why don't we invest more money in young people at the early age of elementary, keep them out of jail, teach them how to be responsible, teach them how to be good citizens, and teach them how to get, have a good job and be successful? I think our system is upside down. Ty Akins. Yes. <clears throat> so, yeah, I've been a 
conservative Republican my whole life. That's the way I was raised up. And as you run a small business, you don't really have a choice but to be conservative because uh, we made it through a recession and there's just a lot, a lot of money to go around. So you have to figure out how to make things work with very little. So those were the values that I brought into the office, uh, you know, when I was elected. And those are the values that I'll continue to uh, to honor and put into effect. Um, the, the problem is, is our community is growing. And a lot of that growth right now is residential growth. And with residential growth, the demand on services is increasing faster than revenue is coming in. And so it's a challenge. It's a challenge to, to be conservative and control spending and to keep providing the services that we have without even adding any new ones. Uh, we just want to maintain what we've got. And so it, it's definitely a challenge, uh, but I'm up for it. Mr. Lock Arnold. Yield to the lady, please. Okay, Thank TG, you. if you would answer this. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Um, so in the qualifications, I came back as a hard Republican, and that's what I stand for here in Habersham County. Conservative views limit the expenses that we have. We have to budget. If we're over budget, something needs to be uh, changed and adjusted. Uh, we cannot spend the money of our citizens if we don't have it and rest on the idea that come fall, we will raise taxes uh, as a surprise. Um, I also believe in supporting our community and providing employment for them here within our county. That is a conservative view. We don't need to hire outside people to come and manage the things that we believe in. Um, secondly, or thirdly, really, um, successful planning, thoughtful planning on what this county really needs, um, and not to put the burden on the taxpayer to pay all those changes that we want to bring here. We need to plan because, yes, growth is coming, but we don't have to be put with that burden every day. Okay, Mr. Arnold. I'm a Republican. Look what's going on. Our borders are open. Drugs are flowing in. You know, that's not right. I, I don't understand what's going on. I really don't understand. And it's flowing into this county. Something needs to be done. Republican, Democrat, but I am a Republican, a very conservative Republican. I always have been. Jobs. You know, they're not going to stay here if we don't give them work. We have multiple opportunities along 85, uh, 95, or whatever it is down there. It's going right through the center of the county. Excellent, excellent opportunity. We need to jump on that. But yes, I am a Republican, a very conservative Republican. But, you know, election time's coming, ladies and gentlemen. We need to take a good long look at it. Thank you. Do we have any rebuttals? Mr. Woodall? You know, we've heard that we've had expense, extensive growth. And really, the 2020 census said we were about 46,000 residents, give or take. Today, we estimate we're at 50,000 residents. So we've, we've grown by maybe 4,000 residents in total, but our tax burden has grown by over $7 million in that same period. That's not coordinated with the, the growth of the number of people that are living here. That is growth in middle management. That's growth in the extensive budget. The one thing we have to get back to is a zero-based budgeting. Since our uh, new county managers have been in place, they've gone away from zero-based budgeting, where they budget uh, carrying forward the, the budget from the previous year with new additions. And in that way, the budget continues to grow outside its realm. Wade Rhodes. Just two things real quick on uh, special local option sales tax items, EMS center and animal shelter. Since those things were budgeted or passed, those things have almost doubled in budget from $4 million to $8 million, from $8 million to $12 million. If you can't afford to build it, you don't build it. If you want to add a two bedrooms to your house and you can't afford but one, you're just going to build one. We're just going to, if we're going to build those projects, which we are required to do by law, you can only build what you can afford. And, and if you have to cut back, you have to cut back and then build it later. Bruce Palmer. Well, first of all, um, we do have zero-based budgeting. 
each department director, they have to submit a budget of everything that they want uh, to be in their budget or everything that they feel that they need. The commission looks at those things. Some things we leave in the budget, some things we cut out of the budget. Um, that it's not like it's just a an open checkbook like some folks would want to believe. And I really do think that our industry, our industrial tax base is what will help to offset taxes from the residential homeowners. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Gigi. Um, based on conservative views, we have a beautiful county here in Habersham, and we're leaving money on the table with having no impact fees for our builders, all the people that are coming here to build. We, over the past six years, we have had 1,100 homes built in our county. We have gotten zero impact fees on this. We have left over $2 million on the table in the last six years. Go ahead, Mr. Arnold. Budgets. You look what they're paying the Habersham County School Superintendent. Look what they're paying the county manager. You talk about budgets. We got to live within our means. Money does not grow on trees. I understand you got to pay people, but, you know, what about the mechanics who work on the school buses? What about the custodians? What about the people that... That, that are, do the boots on the ground. Some of these salaries are ridiculous and, and just way out of whack, way out of whack. And, I, and for the life of me, I just, I don't see it. Mr. Harkness. Um, Mr. Arnold, I, I respect you, but this board has nothing to do with school board and school board uh, superintendent salaries and those things. We leave those up to the school board. Uh, this, this commission, we do have a lot of challenges in the community. Um, friends, we have a slice of heaven here in Haversham County. If you've ever lived anywhere else, you understand and you know that. That's why everybody's wanting to move here. Our growth rate is going to double us in the next 10 years. These men and women right here are going to help control this growth. You need to be looking at who's going to vote. I mean, who you need to vote for that's going to help maintain our way of life and our values here in this community. Thank you all. Second question, in light of the fact that 70% of the county's operating budget is solely for salaries and benefits, and the budget has increased by 48% since 2020, how do you propose funding the increasing demands for necessary services in our county, such as police and fire and roads? And we'll begin with Bruce Harkness. Well, and once again, we have to live within our means. But listen, we have a lot of great people working for this county. We have some of the best people in the world working for this county, working for less money they can work for in Banks County, Raven Hall, Habersham. I mean, why they could almost every employee we've got working for this county could leave and make more money. But the reason why they work for us is they love it here. They love the, the camaraderie. They love the community working here. And we've got to pay them. We have to pay them a, a great salary for, for what they do. But listen, I believe they're overweight in our management and upper management, and I've been fighting against that. I know some fellow commissioners may disagree with me about that, but I do believe that we overpay some people. I believe we're maybe overweighted in some management positions. Um, and another thing I think we need to start hiring from within. We need to hire within this county. We've got a lot of great people in this county, a lot of great people here in this room that would do the job, probably for half of what some of these people who've moved here, who've got the jobs, would do the jobs for. But listen, we have to live within our means, and we have to take care of the people here in this county uh, before we can start raising taxes to get more people in here. Wade Rhodes. Well, there's no, t no question about our budget has exploded. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a sales tax advocate. Uh, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm very in favor of local option sales tax. Now, when you hear that, you say another tax. Well, by law, you have to make sure that you reduce that millage rate if you pass a loss. So your taxes on your, real, on your millage rate should go down. 
But you're going to sales tax brings in dollars from people who are just commuting through our county, visiting our county, tourists that come through our county, and when they spend dollars in our stores, you get pennies for every one of those. So one way to increase the budget would certainly be by a loss tax. Um, I'm not opposed to uh, impact fees, um, particularly in the residential area, because we do need to slow down residential growth, but. but the, the way you change your tax digest is to look at your evaluations on your commercial property. I'm in mean commercial property every day. Our tax evaluations on our commercial property are a third of what they should be. When you, when you uh, have buildings in our industrial park that are valued at $9 a foot and the land is 7,000 an acre, right around the corner, I'm selling land for $45,000 an acre. The tax evaluation in commercial is upside down. Thank you. Ty Akins. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you bring up a good point. And I think going into being a commissioner, um, I I've heard it over the years of living here where people run. They're like, I'm going to come in, I'm going to cut the budget. And really, um, there, was, there was no single thing that I did uh, since I've been commissioner, no class or anything, that I learned more than sitting through the budget hearings and, and, and hearing each department head. Uh, go through and what happened to us and and you saw it right after COVID and I'm a I'm a business owner because I lived through it myself but Chick-fil-A all of a sudden is hanging banners out that says we'll hire you for $18 an hour and McDonald's is hiring $15 an hour and so we had employees we had uh, EMTs and medics and people running heavy equipment in our landfill out there making $13, $14 an hour and so some of them were leaving and we couldn't fill those positions. And so when our budget really went up, I mean, we, just to keep the services we had and just to maintain what we had, we had to increase those salaries. And I can't believe my time is up already. I could go on for a little while longer. But anyway, that was a, that was a very tough, challenging time for this whole commission. Locke Arnold. Go to the lady, please. Thank you. Okay, so in, in reference to our over budget, um, the first step is who we hire as our county manager, because at the end of the day, those positions that have come about in our county have been brought up by our county manager. Um, secondly, we can do a SPLOST, which we already have, and these SPLOSs can be used to fix our roadways, our infrastructure, we can also bring in a flex lost um, that we haven't had in, in many years or ever. Um, we can bring in about $7.4 million each year on that ability to bring in those funds. Um, we have, as you said, 48%, that's $7 million over budget um, or that we've expended here in our county. Um, and there's no law that's going to stop our commissioners from bringing up these budgets. They can, they, there's nothing that's going to stop them. So it's your vote that's going to make a difference. And I promise to not approve any budget and make sure we hire a county manager that is going to protect Habersham County. Thank you. Locke Arnold. Budgets. We have 277 square miles. That's all the property tax money we have. We have to come up with alternate resources of income. That is just the way it is. This is not the 60s and the 70s and the 80s anymore. This is the day. The property tax is not going to support this county. I mean, it'll get us by, but I want to prosper. Other alternatives of income must be found and get off this property tax thing because we've only got so much property and that is it. Budgeting is everything. I believe over a period of time, the commissioners have said, you handle it. This board handle it. You handle it. And I think we need to bring this back and, and kind of decrease the, uh, these boards. They have tremendous authority. And we need to really look at that. The commissioners need to really get back involved and over a period of time, 
I, I believe they space themselves out from that so they, they don't want to have a problem. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Thank you. Bruce Palmer. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to add on to what uh, Chairman Aiken was saying about the, the raises just to keep the people that we had. Along with that, we did create some jailer positions in the jail, four of those, four patrol officer positions, two investigator positions, uh, seven SROs, so there was an SRO in each one of the, the schools, um, nine firefighter positions. How many of y'all live in either Batesville, Fairview, or Macedonia area? And if you live there, do you realize that the fire station that protects your area is not staffed. There's nobody there. Don't y'all deserve the same coverage as the people in the rest of the county? <clears throat> so we still have some work to do. Um, we can put in for a safer grant. That'll pay for those positions for three years and all their training, equipment, supplies. But, you know, there's, there's a lot more to it than... Um, just the initial tax, and we can look at alternative means such as the grant. Thank you. Eric Holbrooks. Could you repeat that question? Because I think we've kind of jumped to where you were going with this. I just want to... Absolutely. I'll repeat it, and um, if you can hold the time at this moment, Sean. In light of the fact that 70% of the county's operating budget is solely for salaries and benefits, and the budget has increased by 48% since 2020, how do you propose funding the increasing demands for necessary services in our county, such as police, fire, roads, et cetera? So I don't speak as eloquently as a lot of these guys up here, okay? I just talk from my heart. I'm just going to tell you the truth. If our services are up to par, then we want to keep them, period. You know, we got to, but I think there's ways that we can dig in and really focus on the individual I don't want to say line items, but, you know, in, in each department, do, how, do we have enough help? Do we not have enough help? Do we have a, do we need a consultant for a manager? You know, these things, all these things are little cuts, little tiny cuts that we can make that can just help us to focus our energies and save some money where we can so that we can continue these services. Thank you. Kelly Woodall. As a person who believes that government is not the best solution for most problems, I always go back to that if we have something we need to add as a service in our community, we look to the private sector as a partnership to do those new services rather than hiring a government employee. What we have done consistently is hire middle management. And I'll give you an example. We lost an individual who was managing about four or five departments, and it took five people to replace him. That cost us in our budget. And when we continue to look for revenue streams, we took over an airport that was run by a private entity. Yes, we made a little bit of money. We didn't make as much, but now we're paying out exorbitant salaries to fund the operation and maintenance of that facility. And we're carrying the liability for, for operating the airport. So for me, on the issue of grants, I believe grants are wonderful when they fund infrastructure projects where we can control what we're doing locally. But if you fund a grant for 18 firefighters for three years, what happens at the end of three years? Are you going to fire 18 of your citizens? Exactly. Absolutely not. You're going to expand your budget to accommodate them. If we need firefighters, we need to budget for firefighters, but we need to restrict our funding and our, our business in other areas. And I can tell you this, if you look in the Northeast Georgia for the past three years, there's not been one article written about trying to save money, cut budgets, or anything else. It's always been about new revenue streams. Thank you. At this time, we'll take um, responses. And remember that, I'm sorry? Oh, you're ready for it. Yeah. Sorry. And just remember that your responses are 30 seconds and you only have one. So let's start with um, Ty Akins. Okay. So I just want to uh, rebut that SPLOST was mentioned. Uh, so the SPLOST, uh, special purpose. So you can't use SPLOST for just anything. Uh, you have to note that and it has to be put on a voter referendum and specifically used for that. And right now roads are coming out of our SPLOST, but really they shouldn't be. The commissioners are started as commissioners of roads and bridges. So we're trying to move our road budget back into our M&O budget where it is supposed to be. So SPLOST is challenged anyway, and we couldn't even pay for the three projects that we had. So using SPLOST for anything else is definitely a challenge. Thank you. Bruce Harkness, I saw your hand. Um, 
Mr. Rhodes, I highly respect you. And um, in rebuttal to what he said about um, tax evaluations and property evaluations, this board of commissioners has nothing to do with that. That is controlled solely by the board of tax assessors. So we can't get involved with that. We can't go down there and say, hey, his property should be valued at this rate or his property should be valued at that rate. Politicians shouldn't be involved in that, and we're not involved in that. That has nothing to do with the Board of Commissioners. And I do agree with him, though. It's out of, out, of, out of whack, but we are giving them money to work on that, though. That is the only thing we can do. Thank you. Wade Rhodes? <clears throat> With all due respect, Bruce, I believe the commissioners appoint people to the um, to the tax board, so you do have some effect of who you put on there. Uh, but so you you don't handle evaluations. That's the job of the tax assessor's office. But they are appointed by the commissioners. Right now, we don't we don't have a, a very good board, in my opinion, that's doing their job to assess commercial properties. I'm telling you, if the work was done to reassess all our commercial properties, it, the, ta the residential taxpayer would get, would get a break. Now, they, are, they have just implemented a new plan and bought a new uh, program to do this. Thank but it, you. But it takes too long to get it in place. Thank you, Wade. Did anyone else want to respond? Gigi McGugan. Thank you. Uh, so in, in reference to that 70% over budget, um, our county, we have brought in a lot of middle management positions. Might I add, most of them are out of county employees. Uh, we have the landfill director, the finance director, the human resource director, parks and recreation director, um, risk management. And let me add another note that we replace our public works director for four other positions for $400,000, over $400,000, when he was making $83,000 and wanted a raise to Thank support you. his family that lives here in Habersham County. Thank you. Anyone else want to respond? Br Bruce Palmer? Uh, just a couple of things real quick. Industry's not paying their fair share of taxes in Habersham County. That's the key to lowering taxes for the, the homeowner. That's... Um, one of the most important things I think <laughs> that we can look at. And as far as uh, middle management and the, the thing that one person was replaced by four, those other four folks were already there. They just were enabled to do their job instead of have somebody over top of them. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Um, Locke Arnold. Don't forget the splash. It's a fair tax. Everybody pays the same. I like it. It beats property tax. It brings in a tremendous amount of money, and we're losing a tremendous amount of, amount of money by not having that. Yes, there are certain places where this can be spent and not be spent, but when everybody pays the same, that's fair. And money doesn't grow on trees. Money does not grow on trees, and I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Anyone else want to respond? Um, Kelly Woodall. You know, we're not the only county where our local option sales tax goes to our school system. I think that was a decision made at a time when it helps support the schools, and we have wonderful school systems here. Raymond County and Baines County also have that, but they also have enacted a T-SPLOS. And a consumption tax means you get to choose where you spend your money. You get to choose how much tax you pay, whereas a progressive punitive property tax doesn't give you that option. But the difference between those two counties and Habersham County is their millage rates are significantly lower. Their citizens know their county manager and their county commissions will not continue to press them on the property tax side. They'll relieve the pressure on the property tax side and let that be carried by those who visit the county and pay the T-SPLOS and the SPLOS. Thank you. Eric Holbrook. Uh, so since we're talking about the loss and the SPLOS, um, I, I just want to weigh my two cents in on this because it, it is the most fair tax across the board. It is, absolutely. But we, you know... I just don't believe people are there right now. You know, we, our taxes have been raised. I don't think asking for another penny or any other tax at this point is good. Now, if we had a little bit more transparency in our government, you know, we might be having a different conversation. I don't know that right now is the right time to be even asking for another SPLOS. Let's get involved with our departments, figure out what they need and fix it. Thank you, Mr. Holbrooks. We're going to move to question three. 
for several years, there has been talk about growth heading to Habersham County. We've already discussed it tonight. Due to the cost of increasing services and upgrading infrastructure to accommodate that growth, would you be in favor of imposing an impact fee schedule for new developments that would reduce the tax burden on existing property owners? And we will begin the answers with Ty Aikens. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, uh, that's a good question. That point's been raised here tonight. We actually had a pretty in-depth, uh, detailed discussion in a group that meets that includes representatives from the Board of Education, all the municipalities, and the county and the development authority. And I think that's all of them. And that, that group is called HC3. And so we had uh, somebody come and speak about impact fees. Um, it is not a simple process. Um, it's a complicated process. You have to plan and specify where that money will go and pinpoint exactly what need it will go for and kind of justify all that because you can't just start implementing some random tax. And so, yes, I think we're in favor of it. I think there were several of the municipalities that were in favor of uh, looking at that. It's just not something that we can uh, snap our fingers really quickly and make happen, but I'm 100% in favor of that. Lock Arnold. Yield to the lady, please. Ms. Thank McGugan. You. So, for the growth um, for Habersham County, um, I think a lot of the talk that I that I hear is almost like a fear, like watch out, they're coming, it's coming, you <coughs> get ready. But we're here. This is our county, and we have to preserve it. Um, and the impact fees is a great way to slow the quick progress of building homes. How about zoning and creating ordinances where? We require people to buy three to five acres in the rural areas of our county to build a home on. What about having impact fees for builders and having stipulations for them to only build homes on one to two acres if they want to build a subdivision? Apartment buildings have impact fees. We cannot crowd our area. We are leaving about $2.5 million by not having, and that's just from the growth that we've had in the last six <coughs> years, leaving it on the table for our county residents to fix the roads, the parks and recreation, the infrastructure, for all that growth that we are expected to have here. So the impact fees, we are at a county that does not have impact fees. Hall County, they have impact fees. Why don't we have them? We deserve them, and Ms. it's McGugan, going to be better for us. Your time's up, ma'am. Sorry. You. No worries. <clears throat> all right, now we'll move to Lock Arnold. Ten years ago, uh, the water plant was $3 million. And uh, the water treatment plant that take, treat that water was $9 million. It's, it's three to one. I believe in impact fees. I'm, it's okay. But once again, uh, the growth is out of proportion. Uh, you look on Highway 17 out there, they put five houses out there on a, a small area of land. And uh, no. If we're not careful, and you mark my word, you do a satellite picture and look down at Brazelton. If we're not careful, that is where we are going. Land management in this county is important, but so is infrastructure. Impact fees, okay. But we, I'm telling you, look at what's happening. We can't put 10 houses on uh, a few acres of land. We've got to be careful about that. I want to see growth around the expressway coming up through here, not 150 houses. That's 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 out of proportion. Thank you, sir. Let's go to Bruce Palmer. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. For several years, there has been talk about growth heading to Habersham County due to the cost of increasing services and upgrading infrastructure to accommodate that growth. Would you be in favor of imposing an impact fee schedule for new developments that would reduce the tax burden on existing property owners? For new developments, absolutely. On current property owners, no, not at all. Um, impact fees are very complicated, though. It's, uh, as Chairman Aiken said, we had a discussion about impact fees and we're looking at how they can, can be implemented in Habersham County to help to offset cost to the citizens in the best possible way. 
those impact fees have to be earmarked for certain things. They can't just be, well, we're going to charge X amount of dollars per square foot on every house or every business or uh, industry. We can, we can charge those things, but where that money goes has to be specifically drawn out in, in that plan. Um, so it, it is a little complicated and time consuming. Uh, I do think that is one way to offset the tax burden or another way to offset the tax burden. Thank you, sir. Eric Colebrooks. Uh, so I keep hearing across the board here, you know, let's find more ways to tax people. Raising, I mean, impact fees, everything like that. In my household, when we are close to the end of our money, we quit spending. End of story. It's tough to do. You know what I mean? As far as new development coming in here, I'm a small government guy. I don't want I don't want to get nobody's business if I don't have to. I want to stay out of people's way. I think that's important. But I also want to protect my county. So I'm not for impact fees and, and coming up with all these different ways to raise the money that y'all have to spend. But we can protect our lands by simple fixes, right? Like there, there's ways that we can do things without raising taxes and coming up with more fees and more services. Thank you, sir. Kelly Woodall. I have to agree with Mr. Holbrooks. One of the things you learn about government is it has an insatiable desire for money. You can't feed it enough. And the only way you starve government is you starve the limited funds. You, you give it limited funds. Now, in our conversations, and I've met people around the county, there's a lack of trust. There's a lack of trust that our county government will reserve uh, their spending and, and uh, keep their budgets low. And so if you add more money to an already uh, growing budget, you're just gonna get a bigger budget. So we really have to focus on regaining the trust. Now I had said in the last forum that I believe in a two acre minimum on the lot size to help slow the growth. But I also believe this, that our cities of Cornea and Clarksville and Demers are already beginning the process of creating what I would call opportunity zones where you can provide affordable housing, smaller houses that are either for lease or for sale that allow for people who are starting their family or starting their career to afford to live in our county. And you take away the two acre minimum there, but you let them build and, and repurpose um, some of the neighborhoods that are blighted or in areas that are underused inside the city limits where infrastructure is already in place and it's already convenient to the jobs that they want to have. We can control the growth, but I'm with Mr. Holbrooks. The more money you pump into government and this government, particularly at the, at the current state we're at, the more opportunity they have to waste. Thank you, sir. Bruce Harkness. We have to fight against all this uncontrolled growth that's coming to our little slice of heaven, people. I'm going to tell you right now, and I'm not a fear monger, but I'm going to tell you the truth about something real plain and simple. If we don't fight to protect our way of life, our values here in this community, I'm going to tell you in 10 years, we're all going to be looking back, saying, scratching our head, what in the heck happened? I'm telling you, I'm one that's going to fight for this uncontrolled growth fight for uncontrolled spending, uncontrolled taxes. I want to fight for you, the tax people of this county. And I'm telling you, our way of life is in trouble. Our values is in trouble. And somebody's got to stand up and fight for our people. And I will do it. Let me say this. Impact fees is not really that complicated. Charge somebody that wants to move here and build a house 2000 bucks. Real simple. Take that $2,000 impact fee. It's not taxes. Send it into the general treasury. Helps pay for those roads, what busts up and cracks up the roads, all those cement trucks and all that coming in here on our roads, busting up our roads. If somebody wants to move here, God bless them. We'll welcome you with open arms. But I believe an impact fee is good to help manage that and help spread the cost to our taxpayers. Thank you, sir. Wade Rhodes. <clears throat> impact fees are a way to slow down residential growth, but it's not my decision or anybody up here's decision it's your decision. Do you want to slow down residential growth? And if you do, you can put impact fees on residential houses. But keep in mind, it's a double-edged sword. The, the builder is going to pass that, that cost right onto the home, and now we've got a little bit higher price home, and everybody's trying to fight, how do you build an affordable home? But I am in favor of it. If that's something the people want to do is slow down residential growth. Now, 
the way to help all this tax thing we're talking about is to think, figure out a way to put sewer from Baldwin all the way down to the county line. You put sewer down 365, you'll have industry and, and, and companies coming up that road, whether you want them or not, but they pay big taxes, they give good jobs, and that should be a break to the homeowner. So I'm, I'm not opposed at all to tax, uh, to uh, impact fees. Just keep in mind, it does increase the house a little bit, and it does slow down residential growth. And if that's what you want, you need to speak up and show up at these meetings and say, I want it slowed down. Thank you, sir. All right, do we have any responses? Go ahead, Ty Akins. Yes, sir, there's uh, two things I want to point out in this limited, bit, limited time that I have to respond. One is, we know what the people in the county want. We just finished our comp plan. And overwhelmingly, they said the same thing they've been saying, and that is they want to preserve the natural beauty of the county. And that's what we want to do. Unfortunately, the situation that we're in right now is the residents and the people in this county did not support zoning of any kind or any kind of land use or any kind of codes to slow down any growth. And that's fine because they didn't want government telling them what to do. And I respect that. But we're at the point right now where we're starting to get a little crowded. We're starting to touch each other, and we're going to have to implement some of these things to slow down the growth. Thank you, sir. Mr. Harkness? I've said it, and I'll say it again tonight before you. I think it's morally wrong to tax you people here in this county to pay for people that want to move here from DeKalb County, Florida, New York. We welcome them. God bless them. I welcome them with an open arm. But why should your taxes go up to pay for those people coming here? And, yes, if it costs a little bit more for somebody to move here, for their house to go up a little bit, to keep your taxes down, I'm all for it. This is a Republican form of government that we have in this country. You elect us. You elect us to do what you think is best and what we think is best for you. And that's what I'll do for you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Ms. McGugan? Yes. I also wanted to add that the impact fees, as they have shared, it's not for us. It's for the people who want to come live here. Um, they can be used, those impact fees can be used for law enforcement, which we know we need, uh, public safety, firefighters and paramedics, as well as the roads and infrastructure for our county. So impact fees is definitely a great opportunity for our county to implement. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Arnold? Houses or jobs? It's as simple as that. Houses or jobs? Thank you, sir. Yes, Mr. Woodall? Just to be clear, I'm in favor of impact fees if they're utilized to build infrastructure down 365 to welcome industry, but I am skeptical that any fees added to our current standards and our current government will be used in that way. It feels like any fee that's being collected presently is being used to expand more jobs and more people in our, in our current government rather than offsetting taxes for our citizens. If we want to do the big projects to welcome industry into our county and build from Baldwin down 365, I'm 100% behind it. But that needs to be written into the, uh, the legislation or the, the ordinance that we're going to do for the impact fees. Thank you, sir. Have you, have you responded already, Mr. Wade? Go right ahead. I'd like to respond to a question a little bit ago, if that's okay. Um, what, what Ty said about roads and bridges being paid for by Splosh, it's special local option sales tax. Roads and bridges, I mean, they're, they're a, necess a necessity, but they're not supposed to be paid for out of that special local option sales tax. We have got to re do exactly what he said. We've got to get roads and bridges back in the general budget, and that splash money should be used for exactly what it's for, special projects. Thank you, sir. Mr. Palmer? While I <laughs> – this is a double-edged sword. Years ago, the roads and bridges stuff was in the – m and budget or the maintenance and operation budget. It was taken out about the time the first splash passed as, to get splash to pass and they decreased the uh, millage rate in order to do that. The problem is now if we add it back to the, the m and budget, there's only so much that we can do without an increase in taxes. So I think while it's not a perfect place for uh, it to be in splice, it beats the alternative. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Question number four. How important is it for the county to build a new jail, and how should it be funded? 
And we'll begin with Eric Holbrook. All right, so number one, quit talking about it. Let's do it. Build it. It don't have to be a thousand beds facility. It don't have to be a 300 bed facility. Build it. Let's quit talking about it. Let's get it done. Quit putting other projects in front of it. Prioritize our spending. You know, animal control building, great. I'm all for it. Everything else, the courthouse, the admin building, they keep getting put in front of it. Let's get it built. Let's do it. But, I mean, for the funding, you know, I was looking this stuff up, and, you know, there's a 10% penalty Im implemented in 2019 by the legislature for us to collect, and it goes into our general fund. But we can't, nobody can tell me how much we've collected because it's just going into this general fund, gets spent however. And there's no way to tell it should be being... If we have that fund, we should be collecting it for the jail, period. Thank you. Kelly Woodall? Yes, the jail absolutely has to be a priority. You know, one of the things I'm conflicted about is that I, I believe in being kind and, and generous and caring for every uh, animal and every person, but we are going to spend almost $7 million to build an animal shelter that was supposed to cost one point seven, And now we don't have any money to build a jail. Now, the SPLOS has been said would not cover the cost of a jail. That is correct. It would not cover the entire cost of an entire jail. But you do not have to build it all at one time. You can build the phases that you need to build in the SPLOS and then the next SPLOS and the next SPLOS. Um, however, one of the things we're running up against is we have uh, failed to, to manage the budgets in the current SPLOS. So when we come to the voters and say, hey, look, we want to do a SPLOS to, to really treat our prisoners that are uh, housed in our jail humanely, we're faced with a skepticism because we have not well uh, managed the money that we've been given before. So SPLOS is a wonderful way to fund these things, but we have to start earning the trust again and how we manage the budgets for these other projects. Thank you. Bruce Harkness? Well, everybody says we need a new jail. I remember when the new jail was built. I was an attorney then. I used to go to the old top of the old courthouse and meet with clients up there. Now, if you think we needed a new jail, that's when we needed a new jail. So we've had a new jail built in the last 27 years. So what do, what do we do? Just keep taxing and spending and build and build and build. So, you know, I know I'm going to make a lot of law enforcement people. They're going to, you know, oh, Lord, he's against this, he's against that. But, yes, I do admit we need a new jail. But at the same time, this commission is sitting up here to represent you people. We have to manage the budget, manage what's coming in, manage your taxes. And right now we don't have the money. People. We don't have the money. So my statement of this is we have to work with the jail staff people and, and work with the new sheriff and the current sheriff and say, look, there's a lot of those guys up there that have skills. If they have skills, let them get on, on that roof. Let them tar that roof. Let them work on the current jail that we have. Let's work on what we have. You know, remodel it, refurbish it, whatever that we need to do. We don't have the time. And the, I mean, we don't have the money, and it's going to raise your taxes tremendously to build a new jail. Thank you. Wade Rhodes. Well, there's no question that the jail is in bad shape, and uh, unfortunately, we need more room. And, um, you know, I'm not naive enough to believe that we can't save every kid, but I tell you what, guys, I I'm more about investing in young people in elementary school and working with our Board of Education and trying to keep kids out of jail. Now, I'm not naive enough that we can save everyone, but by gosh, we can save some of them. And I would suggest to you, Get involved in some of these organizations. Mentor some of these kids. Be part, be part of the Boys and Girls Club. Be part of HUB. Be a T1L1 mentor. You save a couple kids out of jail, just what? You just might have saved yourself some money. It costs $100,000 a year to keep a juvenile in a, in a confined area with the state. A hundred grand. Now, that's not in our jail. That's a juvenile. So that's one thing I would do. But splosh is the only way you're going to pay for it, and, and you're not going to be able to do that until you get roads and bridges back into the general budget, and you're going to have to use a splosh to pay for the jail. Thank you. Ty Akins? Yeah, so, um, yes, we need a jail. The jail we have now is, uh, and I can't believe Commissioner Hartness was an attorney way back then representing that, but uh, that's a classic example of let's build it just barely not quite enough to get by right now. And so it was almost obsolete when we built it. And so let me tell you right now, if you're a taxpayer in this county, you're already paying about half of what the, the, um, it would cost to service the debt on a new jail. The budget going into this 
next fiscal year is probably going to be close to $600,000 just in housing inmates out of the county. So, and that number is only going to go up. <clears throat> and so that and put it in the next blast and that's how you pay for it. Thank you. Locke Arnold. Yield to the lady, please. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Uh, for the jail, uh, my, after speaking to many residents, half of them were, yes, we need a new jail. Half were, we don't need a new jail. We need to maintain the one that we currently have. It's called maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Why did we let that jail deteriorate to the way that it is? Why wasn't it be ta being taken care of? When our current sheriff, or previous, right, current still, um, took office, he wanted a new jail then. It's been 15, 16 years, and we still are pleading for a new jail. How about maintaining the one that we have? We, we got our courthouse. It's no longer a courthouse. Now it's just a building. We got a new government building. An animal shelter? We already have an animal shelter. Why can't we build upon the one that we have now and improve it instead of putting in one to two million dollars into a facility new into our county. Okay, we just hired, we appointed a new judge, a third judge into our county. That's gonna help us move the people who are going through the system to not be in our jails as long as they have been in these past few years. Thank you. Locke Arnold. You use the other guy's money. Forget about county money. Go outside the county and get the money and then build it. We house outside prisoners. 36.5 million or 73 million, we can overcome this budget, get off this property tax. Use the other guy's money, go outside the county, get the money, bring it back in and build a jail. Forget about county money. We don't need it. There's places out there that need a place to put their people, and let's give them that. Forget about using the county's taxpayers' dollars to build a jail. Anytime there is demand for a product or service, and you meet that demand with a product or service, ladies and gentlemen, you have got an opportunity to make some money. Forget about county money. We go outside the county. We talk to these people. Forget about using county money to build a jail. We use their money instead of ours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Bruce Palmer. Um, jail's getting more expensive every day. Um, how many of y'all remembered when the old, our current jail was built, it was proposed that it could be added another floor on top of it. It would last forever. Well, the foundation's sinking on it. So do you think you could add another floor on top? No, probably not. Um, as far as building it with splash, um, what happens when you say you're gonna build it with splash and six years later, splash doesn't pass? Where's the money coming from then? If you use multiple splashes, you run that risk. So typically, and, and I may be incorrect, but I don't think legally you can use a, uh, a splice to cover a project that covers more than one splice cycle. So I, I don't know that that's a, an option. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Responses? Kelly Woodall. Currently, the splice generates between nine and $11 million a year, and all the infrastructure that's being, or all the retail space being built uh, along the Midway area in Cornelia is generating a lot of revenue for our county through splice. If you put that over a seven-year period, you're roughly $77 million, correct? I believe the last budget I heard for a, a jail was somewhere around $50 million, and then when you added your interest, you're around $70 million. You can do it in one splice. You make it a tier one project, or that is your one project that you're gonna do on the splice, you build it, you get it done, you do it in budget, and you earn the trust of your constituents. Thank you. Anyone else want to respond? Bruce Harkness? Uh, yes, I agree. We need a new jail, but, you know, grandma down the street needs a new house also. Um, what do we do? Um, we have to live within our means, and I'm not trying to make any enemies up here. I'm just saying that we have to work this out in our budget. 
The people have told me overwhelmingly they don't want their taxes to double. Now, if the people want to vote for a SPLOS tax, then I'd be for it to build a, build a new jail. Um, but that's up to the people. I'm not for any new property taxes. Thank you. Anyone else? Gigi McGugan. Uh, so in reference to the jail, we also have land adjacent to the jail that we can build and add on to the jail and add new cells, um, these pods that they have for the prisoners to go um, to. So that is an option as well. We have land available to expand our jail. Thank you. Anyone else want to respond? I'm sorry, Bruce Palmer. Um, yes, we do have land adjacent. That's where the new jail is going to be built. Mm -hmm. The problem with the, the, another problem with the jail that's there now, the essential facilities such as the kitchen, the laundry, some of those areas are over capacity at what uh, is there now. So that's not, you're going to have to build all those uh, for the new jail anyway, or replacement jail. And as far as the third judge, third judge is great, but guess what? Thank We're you. getting a fourth county. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Anyone else wanted to respond? Locke Arnold. We have the property. We have the infrastructure. Where space is limited, you go up. Look at Fulton County. Perfect example. We don't have to have tons and tons of acreage. Yes, it's a jail, but we're going to have to have one. I want to get off, I want everybody to think about, there's only so much money that comes in this county. We need to go somewhere else and find that money and bring it in because they need a place to put their people. If they're going to spend all that money, maybe Thank they'll you. invest in this county. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Thank you, ma'am. I, I, I did not get a chance to rebut. Do you mind if I do? Absolutely. Is that okay? No problem. Um, Commissioner Harkness, when you go to meet with a client at the jail, where do you meet with him at? In the jail. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> State dinner. In the, is it in the laundry room or the kitchen? Wherever they can put us. Wherever they can put us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wasn't trying to put you, I hope you know i I wasn't trying to put him on the spot. I was trying to make a point that, yeah, I, it's my understanding that's what, if they go to meet with the attorney, they have to go meet in the laundry room. They can barely hear. And even if they do it by a Zoom meeting or something, there's not a space to do it. So it, the, the problem with the jail is not about maintenance. It's, it's a problem that it's just not functional and Thank it's not safe. You. Thank you. Absolutely, Wade. So Ty's exactly right. There's no place for an attorney or a preacher to meet anybody in that jail unless they're going to meet them in the kitchen the laundry room. And do you know what? Our jail is not handicap accessible. Correct. Let that one sink in. So, I mean, it's easy to beat up things down the road, but that jail is not handicap accessible. So we have to address this problem sooner than later. Thank you. All right, question five. Over the last several years, Citizens Trust in government and elected officials has deteriorated. What would you do to improve citizens' trust if you are elected? And we will begin the answers with Wade Rhodes. Well, there's no doubt about that. That's a key problem in our entire country. Um, we have to do a better job of communicating with the voters. You know, uh, I was at a planning commission meeting the other day and somebody said they didn't even know that something got passed on their street that the sign was so small they couldn't even read it. You know, we got to do a better job of letting the public know when developments come to our planning commission meeting. We got to do a better job of no notifying you that things are happening. And, and guess what, guys? It's on you too. You have got to be more involved in your government. You have got to, when you see a sign out there that says rezoning, stop and read it. Go to the planning commission meeting, not just when it's on your street. If you see something in the southern end of the county, guess what? If you live on the north end, that, that development could affect you on the north end. So it doesn't just happen when it's on your street in your neighborhood. So transparency is critical. Why, why do we buy things like land and not let the public know about it? We just, we just bought 30 acres next to the rec department. Did anybody know that? I'm in the real estate business. I knew it was for sale, but I didn't know we bought it till after it already happened. You have got to let the public know what you're doing. Mr. Thank you, sir. 
Ty Aikens. Yeah, so um, I believe it was Kelly Woodall touched on this a minute ago. Um, so if we want to restore public trust, uh, the projects that we said we were going to do with SPLOST were, were grossly under underestimated. And, and that just kind of created a cascade of problems. Now then, out of respect to past commissioners, because this is an incredibly tough and challenging job, I don't want to disparage anybody or anything they've done um, when they planned for that. But it was was very very poorly planned. So here the the voters all approved these three projects: the radio system, the uh, new animal shelter, and the central fire and EMS building that we really need, you know. But they were so far underfunded, and then compounded by inflation, which is something that nobody's even really touched on here tonight. But when you talk about challenging problems and and budget growth, I mean, you know, fuel prices tripled there for a couple of years. Anyway. The first thing we can do is plan accordingly and build things that last, or don't build them at all. Mark Arnold, yield to the lady, please. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Arnold. McGugan. Thank you. So, you want my trust, or I want your trust to believe in me that I'm here as a conservative Republican to protect our land, to protect our taxes to bring in ways that we can improve our county as a whole for the betterment of us and for all that is here for Habersham County. Um, we need our residents to be involved. So as a county commissioner, I will earn your trust by getting you involved, sharing with you what's coming up, what's going on with our county, what are our options, what are the pros and cons to the things that are up for discussion. I will provide education, knowledge, um, a clear view, clarity, transparency for our budget, uh, transparency for all the projects that are underway here for our county as well, and building our community. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Arnold? 20 some thousand voters in this county, we're lucky to get five or 6,000 show up to vote. So what does that tell you? They don't trust, you know. They've lost interest. They've lost trust. Ladies and gentlemen, we just had a judge point a gun at two sheriff deputies, and they didn't do nothing. You talk about trust? No one's above the law. we got to bring this trust back in. There's only a few voters. Nobody wants to go vote anymore. They say they're going to do whatever they want to anyway. Trust is everything. But still, 20 some thousand people go to show up to vote. I mean, they're registered to vote. And look how many, watch and see how many people show up to vote this time. How many people showed up to vote last time? They've lost trust in the government of Biden in this county. We need to do something about it. Thank Courts you. Or anything. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Mr. Palmer? Um, town hall meetings, how many of you have been to one? A few? I typically do them once a quarter. I wish that there was a turnout like this at one of them. Usually there's a handful of people there. And most of the time it's the same handful of people. That's a way to try to be transparent, to tell you what's going on in our local government, but not very many people attend them. Um, I, <laughs> I have my phone number everywhere. You know, if you have a problem or a concern or a comment, or if you just want to tell me that either you think I'm doing a horrible job or a good job, you know, I'm available to the the citizens every day. Um, as far as the splash projects and transparency, the radio system that was allotted, not budgeted, allotted $7.2 million. The consultant that the county hired told them it was going to cost $14 million. Guess what it cost? $13 million and change. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Eric Holbrooks. So, 
this whole time I've been running for this seat, there have been three words I've described myself, transparency, communication, and relationships. And I stick hard with those. But I'm going out and meeting with everybody. For example, tomorrow I'm going to work at the animal shelter. You know why? Because if I want to do this job, and I do, I want to understand what our departments are going through. What are their struggles? If we understand what they're going through, we can serve them better. That's transparency. That's getting out there and getting the job done. You know, in respect to Mr. Palmer saying about the town halls, you missed a great opportunity there. I've talked to a lot of people that came to a couple of them, but what I'm told is they get told what's happening, but they're not, there's no communication as far as how they want to be involved with it, right? Like, how do we fix things? What I'm doing in our community is I'm going out and I'm talking to people. I'm shaking their hands right where they are, right where they live meeting them where they are, figuring out what is best for them to move forward, being transparent, communicating and building relationships with our cities and our surrounding uh, citizens. Thank you. Kelly Woodall. You know, I think uh, everything rises and falls on leadership. And when I met with the county manager as I started my race, I asked her her position and she said, we need more money, more people. And if I knew we didn't have a local office of sales tax, I wouldn't have taken the job. And from that point, I realized we were serving under a leadership who believed in a larger, more expansive government. And I knew immediately that I had a difference of opinion. Um, when it comes to things like the Sploss Project, the Orchard is a prime example. I met with the citizens there last week, or week before last. And one of the things you find out is there were several locations that could have been used for that tower. And the consultants that we hired to put together this system had multiple locations. But when it came down to the decision, they told our leadership in the county that this is the site we should use, and if we use any other site, it'll cost us more money. Those citizens were never told that the other sites that were viable sites, why they weren't viable. So the citizens were met with, told them there's multiple sites, so is not your site, but we're gonna, we're gonna look at these other sites. But then they came back and built it there. Do what you say and say what you, you mean. If you don't tell the truth and you don't tell it straightforward, you cannot trust your leadership. Thank you. Bruce Harkness. You know, really, we have some great people here in this county, in this community, in this room. It's a great place to live here in Haversham County. And I've been honored to serve you. And I stand on my record. I did what I said I was going to do. And if I'm reelected, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to ask the hard questions. I'm going to fight against taxes. I've never voted against new property taxes. And I represent everybody. My doors open at my office. And I stay up to midnight or after every night talking to people about their issues and their problems and their questions. Um, and that is my concern, you know, is, is your concern. I want to represent you and do what you think needs to be done. Local government is the beginning of government in our county. If we don't have it right here, it's going to be wrong everywhere. But I'm going to tell you also, if we don't con control runaway rampant spending and control runaway rampant taxes, it's going to derail this community. It's going to derail this country if we don't get spending under control. Um, I will continue to ask the hard questions and I'll continue to ask, get the answers for the people. I'm gonna continue fighting for you. Any responses? Okay, uh, Ms. McGugan. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so just one, as a Georgia history teacher, I just wanna say that our country was founded by government, our founding fathers. So we sit here saying government, big government, small government, it's government. And I'm here to represent you, our residents of Faversham County. So vote and educate yourself on who the candidates are, because after all, these are the people that we're putting up here. Mr. I just want to echo that. I love this community. I moved here in 2005 to work for Piedmont University, and I found a home. I found a place that I want to serve and a place I want to make sure is good and, and ready for my children to live in and, and have the same experience that I've had. But we have had some bad decisions made in this county government. For instance, the piece of property, the 30 acres that was bought, uh, it appraised at roughly uh, 400,000, I believe it was, and it was purchased for 750. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about you, but that sounds like a bad business decision. And so for those kind of things, those are the things that motivate you to protect and serve your community because you really wanna make good decisions. We can do this. We have qualified, talented people in our community who will give their time and talent to serve it. And I think we should pull from those resources. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Palmer. Uh, I do have one thing to mention about the radio tower up at the orchard. Um, the citizens up there were told that 
we would look at other tower sites uh, to see the feasibility of them. This is an eight, I think it's eight towers, is that not right? Mm -hmm. Eight tower site, and all of them have to be strategically placed in order for us to get the coverage that we're looking for, for our emergency responders. And that moving that site would either reduce the coverage or dra dramatically increase the cost. Mr. Palmer, thank you. Mr. Rowe. Just real quick, guys. Transparency is a two-way street. You got to get involved. You know, you, you elect people to run this county and make decisions, but you got to hold them accountable. And the only way you hold them accountable is show up at meetings, every meeting you possibly can. Now, I don't know everybody's busy and they got a life to leave, and some of people are retired and they don't want to spend their entire time going to meetings. But it's a two way street. You got to hold them accountable and you got to show up at meetings and you got to express your opinion. And I'm glad to see this big crowd here tonight. Thank you, sir. Yes, Mr. Arnold. Don't forget to vote. It's important. It's a way you can say, I put my, you know, I put my dime in. People have lost trust. That's why the turnout of the vote is low. Don't forget to vote. Go out and talk to people and say, have you voted? Have you voted? I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, Independent, what. We need to get the people back to the polls, and then better decisions, better people, and better things will be happening. And to all the lovely ladies out there, happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Yes, Mr. Harkness. Thank you. Um, in rebuttal, um, at a lot of the Board of Education meetings, nobody shows up. You know why? They elected people to represent them. And they elected leaders to represent the people. At a lot of our meetings, a lot of people don't show up. You know why? They elected people to represent you. Most everybody in this room works, and you have a job. And a lot of people can't show up at those meetings. But we welcome you. Welcome you at every meeting. But what I'm saying is you're welcome to call us and talk to us and say this is what's important. This is what means something to us. And I do believe that the people here does have trust in us. I do believe that. Mr. Akins. All right. I just want to add this in. So I think it's very easy to say and talk about rampant runaway spending and huge government and we're spending too much and we gotta we gotta take care of that. This is a very, very tough job. And there have been so many different studies have done so many different ways, and every one of them says when you take a farm and you turn it into a subdivision, there is no greater flip of revenue from uh, tax good to the, you know, it's, it's paying for itself. You turn it into a subdivision, it's costing you more in services. And that's what's happening to this county. They're building more and more homes and more and more homes. And it's costing us just to provide the same services that we have. Thank you, adding. Mr. Aikens. It's costing more and more every day. Thank you. So we're going to um, have to skip some questions to get to the end. And I thank you all so much for your in-depthness and honesty. Um, last question. What services do you feel could be privatized instead of funded by the county? And I'm, I'm just throwing out an example, gymnastics. And we're going to start with Bruce Harkness. On our last question, we did flip a coin to see who would go first. Um, are we going to be allowed a closing? Yes. After this, we'll have closings. Um, well, anytime you can privatize things and get it out of the hands of the government, I'm all for it. You know, if you can take the, the burden off the taxpayers, I'm all for it. Um, and the problem is many times the current government, uh, even this county government, state government, federal government, they want to take over everything. When you can put things back in the hands of good people to run things uh, and can make things work, I never believe that big government is the best way to go. I do believe in our people. You sitting right here tonight, you represent this county. You may be 100 people here. You represent the 50,000 people that we have in this county. And I appreciate you being here. And But I do believe, ultimately, the end of the game, end of the night, when you lay down, I do believe that you trust us. 
because you voted for us and we do work for you. And I promise to keep doing that for you. I'm going to keep working hard for you. And every chance I get, I go to these meetings all around the state and I don't charge the taxpayers a dime to go to these meetings to find out more for you. Thank you, Mr. Harkness. Wade Rhodes. Well, this is a tough one because I'm big in athletics and involving kids and uh, projects to help them grow and be a better citizen. But we, I started the soccer program in 1994. I ran that for 23 years. We are a private organization. We, we don't, the rec department does not run our soccer program. We have a board that runs our soccer program and we charge parents a fee for their kids to play soccer and pay for their uniforms. So I believe in user fees. That's not going to be real popular with some people with a lot of kids, and they have a user fee for football, a user fee for basketball. But you can privatize a lot of those athletics and, and uh, get them off the back of the rec department. Um, the landfill. There's no question in my mind we have got to have a transfer station. There's no way in the world we'll, we can buy more land, get that permitted for the EPD, and have another landfill. So a transfer station could be privatized. Um, there's no question. I think that's the route we need to take. Um, one that I, I have mixed emotions about it. I've heard about privatizing a jail. Thank you. But, but, Thank um, you, Mr. That's Ritz. A, that's a tough ball of wax. Ty Akins. <clears throat> yes, so right off the top of my head, the answer to your question, it, the landfill really comes to mind. Um, now, you know, as it is right now, we own the land. And uh, the system to treat the water and the leachate and all that is in there. And it's been making money. Uh, it's just not going to last. So it's a finite resource. And so we're going to have to look at, and, and I think the, this commission that's, that's serving now, and it sounds like most of the people that are running are all open, uh, and I certainly am, to any and all solutions, including privatization. But as it says, government does the jobs that private business can't. And it's kind of like a necessary evil. Thank you, Mr. Akins. Locke Arnold. Yield to the lady, please. Thank you. So when it comes, this is a great question. When it comes to privatizing, we really need to look at how it's going to benefit us as a taxpayer. So for me to sit here and tell you the landfill should be, the rec center should be, we don't know. We have to look at all the pros and cons and see what is our best option. Um, when it comes to that. Would I love the YMCA to take over the rec center and make it look like the one in Gainesville? That would be awesome for us, having a beautiful facility like that. Um, the landfill, the recycling can also be privatized. But again, it's five people that come together to make these decisions for you all. So we really need to look at what are the good and bad moves for these, for these changes for our county. Thank you. Locke Arnold. Privatizing, when you do that, usually uh, the money goes up in salaries. Take the nurses. Uh, a lot of these hospitals, they've, uh, uh, they've sub subbed out to these nurses. They're all good people. They're all good nurses. But uh, it costs more money because they can deal a contract. And these contracts go from anywhere from six months to a year, whatever. Privatizing costs more money. But still, and there's uh, places where uh, it is, uh, it's doable and it's feasible and it's the right way to go. But still, privatizing, it, it gets government out of it, but then we need the county system in it so it will keep it in, in, on track. So it, it's got its pros and its cons. In some places it'll work, in some places it doesn't work. But privatizing is not a bad deal, but usually it costs just a little more money. Thank you. Bruce Palmer. Um, <laughs> I'm not opposed to looking at, at any service that we have as far as if we can do it a, a better way or a different way. But I will say generally a private business is in business to make money, correct? Whereas the local government at least should be in business to provide the best possible level of service at the lowest cost to its citizens, taxpayers, you. So while I'm, I'm not opposed to looking at it, uh, I've seen instances to where different things has um, EMS, for example. Some communities privatize EMS. 
but what you need to understand about that, most of the time whenever you do that, the level of commitment to service to your municipality decreases. They'll take ambulances and move them to, to different counties or district, different areas that they have. So I think we have to be very careful about privatizing stuff. Thank you. Eric Holbrook. So this is one of my strong points. This is what I'm good at. And you want to know why? Because when we talk about the landfill, I drove a trash truck. I drove an 18-wheeler hauling trash from these transfer stations for two years. I know how it can be better for our community. I'm very good at this. But it's not the end all to solve our solutions for the landfill. It's a start of a conversation. It's a, a talk about it and figure out what's the best next step for us. Is privatizing the landfill an option? Absolutely, it's an option. It's a perfect option. You know, I was told um, by Commissioner Palmer that it's an enterprise fund. It makes its own money. But when you dig in and you look at their unrestricted net position, they're in a deficit of almost $1 million. That's not making money, even if you're keeping costs low for the citizens. It's, if you privatize the landfill, it's not that big of a difference on cost. If you don't believe me, call c and D down there in Banks County. You'll see. Thank you. Kelly Woodall? I have to say I fundamentally disagree that the government should be in business. I don't think we should be an impediment to private industry in any way. We should be a conduit to it. To say that the, the government will do something at a lower cost to the, and more efficiently than a private business forgets the fact that the government charges you up front a tax to fund the infrastructure, then charges you a fee to use the same service, and they get it on both sides. Whereas the private industry has to market themselves and has to do a job so well that they, they develop a market that you want to use their service. Listen, the government has some great things that we do, and that's in your public safety, your fire, those kind of things. But when it comes to things that can be privatized, we should not carry the liability. We should not carry the burden of it. We should, we should be a conduit for business to make a, a footing here in the county and do well for themselves. That's the entrepreneur spirit, and we have so many in our county that have done that. Uh, I, I would say this, you know, gymnastics, when we took it over the rec department, it cost us $500,000. That was an operating entity that was doing its own thing. And when we took it under our rec department, the cost for that went to $500,000. I can't disagree more that the, the, federal, the, the mm -hmm. local government should not be in business to make money. We should be in business Thank you. to help businesses do their work. Thank you. In lieu of time, we will not be able to respond to that question, and we'll go into closing statements. We're going to go opposite of how we did opening statements, and we're going to begin with um, Gigi McGugan. Thank you. So as I stand here before all of you count Habersham County residents, I promise to do my footwork, to educate myself, to work hard for you to keep our taxes low, to end the over-budgeting, and to serve our county day in and day out as your commissioner, District 5. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Locke Arnold. I'll never vote for a property tax increase. Somebody will be going home. We'll cut the budget some way or another. That's all there is to it. There's too much money being spent. People are making a lot of money. When you have people come to work at 9.30 and 10 o'clock, they take two hours for lunch and they go home at 3, put the people back to work. I'll never vote for a property tax increase. The money's got to come from somewhere. We just need people in there to figure out how to do it. Thank you. Ty Akins. Yes, yeah, so first off, I'd just like to say it was an honor to begin with to be elected to serve this community. Uh, I've served it in a lot of ways over the years and a lot of variety of different organizations. It's an, I've said it, now this will be the third time, it's an extremely challenging, tough job. Uh, there's a very steep learning curve. And um, I feel like I just have in the last year and a half or so really started to get a handle on how things work and I think that <laughs> Um, decision making is getting better. I'm accessible. My business sits right on Washington Street. My cell phone number is on my business cards. Thank you. Be glad to talk to anybody anytime. Wade Rhodes. Here's the bottom line. If you were born and raised here, you are truly blessed. If you moved here over the last 10 to 5 years, you're blessed too. 
but you probably moved here to escape the things that we're talking about today. So you've got to get involved. You have got to speak up and let elected officials know what do you want this county to look like over the next five years? How do you control where the growth is going? And how do, how do you get involved? You cannot sit idly by and not get out and speak up your mind and show up at the polls. And Thank by you. the way, May 21st is my birthday. That'd be a great birthday <laughs> present. <laughs> Thank you, Wade. Bruce Harkness. Thank you all for letting me serve you. Uh, the last four years, it's been an honor to serve you. And uh, if I'm reelected, I'll continue to serve you. I'll be your taxpayer's bulldog fighting for you. And I promise to do that. Um, we have a lot of retired people in this community. We have a lot of people on fixed income in this community. One or two times I said we had some poor people in the community and some people come to me and say, you need to quit saying that. But anyhow, we do. We have a lot of people that I worry about. You know, we have to stop all the higher taxes. And we have to be worried about the people here. And that's what I'm worried about. I want to work Thank for you. I want to fight for you. I'm worried about our county. We have to manage and control growth. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly Woodall. You know, when I moved here in 2005 to work for Piedmont University, I'd been an engineer for a division of GE, and I moved up here after a, a bit of a journey and, and working with students, and I found a place that I call home. And I think when we uh, live in a community that we love, we're called to serve it. We're called to put our hearts and minds together to serve it and to do the best. But there comes down to core principles. And for me, core principles are that I don't believe government should ever uh, be the first option for the solution. I think that only leads to bigger and, and more intrusive government. I do believe that our citizens deserve uh, leadership that is accessible, okay. that's transparent, and that's honest with you. Thank and I'll you. tell you this, I will serve faithfully. Eric Holbrook. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you all for having this event. This, this building, I went to elementary school here. This Lee's kindergarten right here. This was my seat where Bruce is sitting right there. <laughs> I mean, so I have a lot of memories from this county, and I want to serve it because I love it. I've lived here my whole life. I want to serve you and work for you. And I'm going out. I'm meeting these departments in these cities. I'm meeting with them. I went to Baldwin the other night. I'm going to Mount Airy this soon. I'm having these discussions to be the thank best you. I can for you. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce Palmer. First of all, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I, it, it's truly humbling to be a commissioner. It is a, a big job. It's a lot to do. But just the fact that y'all put y'all's faith in me the last four years is humbling. I asked you, if you will, to put your faith in me again for the next four years. Uh, go out and vote on May 21st or before for early voting. Um, I'll kind of describe myself with four words. Thank you. Tra go ahead. Transparency, knowledge, experience, and last but not least, integrity. Thank you. Thank you. And this concludes our commissioner's debate. We will begin. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much to all of you. And um, we will start with the Board of Education at 8.15.
Uh, we'll be getting started here in just a moment with the Board of Education. We just finished up with the County Commission. Uh, I thought it went very well. Uh, and we hope that the Board of Education goes just as well, if not better. Uh, we got some great candidates. Uh, so give us just a moment. We're going to be going live uh, probably in about two minutes. Does that sound good, Jeremy? This evening, those online and those here in the audience, uh, here at the Denver Municipal Complex, uh, we're still uh, doing our debate. This time it's with the Board of Education. I want to refresh the rules. I have a lot of audience here, so they know the rules. So uh, each candidate will have 30 minutes for an opening statement. 30 seconds for an opening statement. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it's been a long day. <laughs> uh, each candidate will have one minute to respond to questions. After each candidate has responded to a question, each candidate will be allowed 30 seconds for rebuttal if needed after all the candidates have answered the question. Be respectful, no personal attacks, stick to the facts and stay on topic. Moderators retain the right to cut off microphones of candidates who do not follow the debate format and rules. Remember, this is your opportunity to convince the voters that you deserve to be elected. Nora is now going to introduce the candidates. For District 1, Brett Barden. District 1, Doug Westmoreland. For District 2, Dr. Robert Barron. And for District 2, Ernie Garrett. Let's begin with opening statements, and we will begin with Brett Barden from District 1. Yeah, good evening. Thank you for having us tonight. <clears throat> I'm Brett Barden. I'm a Haversham Central High School grad, something I'm very proud of. Uh, I believe my, my current role as an engineering manager uh, and working in a manufacturing setting and in the STEM field and technical and business role uh, would bring valuable insight to our Board of Education. I also want to try to bring all of the, the focus tonight on, on what I believe to be the fundamentals. So that would be uh, our students, teachers, and taxpayers, and as far as how the board operates, that's with uh, accountability and transparency. Thank you. Mr. Westmoreland, coach. Hello, everyone. My name is Doug Westmoreland, Coach West of many out there, and I'm seeking my third term on the Board of Education. I have served our school system as a teacher, as a coach, as an assistant principal, principal, and a member of the Board of Education for the last 40 years of my life. Not only am I an educator, but I'm also a parent whose children went through this school system. So I definitely understand the needs of the students from the viewpoint of an educator as well as a parent. Our board has worked well together to keep our system great. A vote for me is a vote for keeping our school motto, one team, one mission, success for all students. Thank you, sir. Dr. Barron. know that I stand for being positive, upbeat. I want to serve. I've served for 16 years. I want to serve for, for at least four more. I can do the job. Please put your trust in me. Mr. Garrett. Growth mindset. 
this is a model of thinking that our teachers and school system use in their classrooms to instill in their students. It means having the attitude that you can continually improve by doing the hard things, seeing mistakes as opportunities for growth and seeing problems as challenges. This is the mindset adopted by our teachers and our principals in our school system. However, we have heard our current board members say good is good enough and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I should ask more from our board members than what we, should we ask more from our board members than what we ask from our current teachers? Thank you, sir. Now we've had opening statements. Let the questions begin. First question, everyone sitting here tonight qualified as a Republican. What virtues and values as a Republican will you bring to the table in the public office are, you're running for? And we'll start with Brett Barden. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm a Christian, and uh, many, most of the time I'd say that uh, uh, my values and faith align with, uh, with the ideology uh, of the Republican Party. Um, but, you know, more specifically, uh, I think that we, a, lot of, a lot of crazy stuff happening in this, in this country right now, and I think it's because we have an all-Republican board of education that keeps a lot of that, I'd call nonsense, from, from coming into our school system. So I think that's important. But um, as far as government goes, uh, as a Republican, I'm a fiscal conservative. Uh, our board has a tremendous amount of power and the power to tax. Uh, and as a Republican, we cannot take that lightly. Um, so it's important that we, that our constituents see that we use our funds efficiently because of that power that we wield. And lastly, I believe in, in small government. So, um, you know, going back to government telling teachers how to teach, uh, I don't think is the way to do it. And Common Core, I believe, was, uh, was a mistake in retrospect. Um, because you know, it maybe had a good idea in, in introducing standards, but it took a lot of power away from the teachers. Thank you, sir. Coach Westmoreland. Yes, Jerry. Uh, I'm a conservative Christian Republican, and uh, as you look in this county, you see how strong our county is being Republican. All of our elections decided on this primary. You don't see many Democrats running, so uh, I've always been a Republican. I believe in the, the Republican principles and the platform in which they stand. And, uh, and I, I want to bring to the table those conservative values. Uh, I want to make sure that we are good stewards of our taxpayers' money. Uh, but we are also going to look at what we need for our students. If our students need something and we have finances there available, we want to provide those finances. Uh, we want the best for our students. We want the best for our teachers. But yet, we're going to be good stewards of the money, but yet, we, we've got one of the greatest school systems in the state of Georgia, and we want to keep it that way. So we're going to make sure that we empower the, uh, the funds available at these schools so they, can, so they can still be successful in what they're doing. So, so. Thank you. Dr. Barron? For 16 years, I've proudly served this board. All these 16 years, 10 of them, either I was a chair or a vice chair. I've seen a lot of changes. I've seen a lot of great and wonderful changes, improvements. When I first came on, as I said before, we looked up to a lot of counties. We looked up to a lot of systems. But today, a lot of systems throughout the, throughout the state of Georgia are looking up to us. They see us as a model board. They see us as a model school system. I'm proud of what we've accomplished. I am extremely proud of, of the teachers that, you know, they can teach, they do what they know they can do. The administrators, they do a fantastic job. The directors, they all do their things. The principals, all the way up to the superintendent, we have a great system, and let's keep it that way. Thank you. Ernie? When I was young, I was uh, told an old saying that says, when uh, I was young, I was too compassionate to be anything but a Democrat, but now that I'm older, I'm too poor to be anything but a Republican. And I believe that. I'm a fiscal conservative, but the reason I'm a Republican is primarily because I'm a Christian, and my values and my uh, beliefs do not line up to the Democratic Party. I believe in low, uh, small government. I believe that people should be in charge of their own finances and their own beliefs. So I'm a strong Republican and a strong fiscal conservative, and I believe in lower taxes and giving that money back to the people to put in their pocket. I believe we can do a better job with our finances, and I believe the school board takes a big chunk of our taxes every year, and I think we can do a better job with managing that money. 
I'd appreciate your vote. Responses? Thank you. Question number two. It is a national issue, the increasing number of non-English speakers entering our country on a daily basis, many of whom have come to call Habersham home. How do you propose to accommodate these children and support them academically and culturally? And we will begin with you, Doug Westmoreland. Well, first of all, we love our students in Habersham County. We love the ones that come to us, and we're going to embrace their needs regardless of what background they come from. We have, if, if, if you just look, we have set records for advancing students that speak other languages. Just come to our graduation and look at some of the people that graduate, some of the past valedictorians and salutatorians that came in and speak a, a different language. So, yes, we're, we're going to embrace the needs of our students. We're going to... Uh, make sure that they have a quality education. We're not going to turn anyone away. You know, the, the saying is that public, edu public, public education is the great equalizer. And that's what we want to empower our students to be, regardless if they're English speaking or non-English speaking. Thank you. Robert Barron. We have seen a, a good number of uh, an influx or a greater number of people coming in who have a second language. And we have completely taken them in. I don't know of any uh, school that has not embraced them, has not taken them to whatever degree they need to, to be. We've got some that come in and are very, very limited. But again, look at our graduation rate. We're getting them prepared for the secondary level, we're getting them prepared for the workforce. We are teaching them. You know, we we take care of them, and we're going to continue to take care of them. Thank you, Ernie Garrett. Um, as you know, I just uh, retired in uh, June of last year, and in the last few years, I've noticed that um, we have a lot more uh, students coming across from Central and Central America and Southern. Um, parts and um, a lot of these kids that are coming they're 15 16 years old they've never attended school a day in their life and that's a challenge and so I think um, we need to do a lot more with um, and sometimes I being an educator I feel like that a traditional education and a traditional diploma is not always the best path for some of these kids because if you drop somebody in at 16 and they've never spoken English or never learned to read and write Spanish or anything else, and some of them have very different dialects that they don't even speak Spanish. If you drop these people into a regular classroom, you're just taking away from other kids. Um, I feel like we need to um, have a lot more for Newcomers Academy from e uh, elementary all the way to 12th grade and maybe have uh, different types of programs like technical education, things like that, that they could do. Thank you. Brett Barden. Yeah, I think it goes back to the mission of the school system, and that's the success for all students, right? And the all is the key word there. Uh, I met a young lady when uh, I went to speak at the, uh, the engineering class uh, at, at Habersham Central recently, and she was a, a non-native English speaker, uh, so she learned English as a second language, and, and the list of accomplishments uh, that she had made in her time in high school was just nothing beyond amazing. So, um, you know, it's really neat to see students overcome English or language as a barrier. Uh, so we have to continue to offer resources there. And then also we want them to, you know, stay in our community. I'd say that as, as a culture, you know, Hispanics, to, uh, the Hispanic culture tends to be hardworking and family oriented. And so, uh, you know, we retain those people in our, our county. The next generation will speak English natively and, and carry forward that hard work ethic uh, that you tend to see with the culture. So, um, you know, success for all students is key. Thank you. Responses? Thank you very much. Question three. Transparency has been a topic of discussion. In every aspect of life, there is always room for improvement. What improvements would you make, if any, so the Board of Education could be more transparent to parents and taxpayers alike? And we'll start with Dr. Barron. Transparency has been, and it will continue to be, as long as I'm on the board, a major part. 
We are transparent. There is nothing that we do that has not been discussed uh, at length. We're not a board that just, you know, rubber stamps things. We are a board that, just like this afternoon, we met and we talked a lot uh, you know, about certain topics and we're in harmony. And that's the thing that I see that we've got to do. We have to be able to, you know, continue to work together. And, you know, we've got the, uh, we got the abilities, we got the facilities, we can do miraculous things with, you know, with our folks and trying to get them ready for the future. Mr. Garrett. Well, I agree with uh, Dr. Barron that the current board is in harmony and work together. The problem with that is the transparency. They don't tell the rest of us. Um, we go to the board meetings and things are voted on 5-0. We don't know how they got to that decision. They don't talk about it openly in the meetings most of the time. A lot of those decisions are made behind closed doors or something. I'm not sure how they get to those uh, decisions sometimes, but... Um, I spoke to some of the board members three or four years ago, and I said, I don't think it's possible for five elected officials to, to agree 5-0 on every topic that you vote on. I, and like I said in the last uh, forum, my family of four can't be unanimous on where to go out to eat at any one night. So I don't know how five people can vote 5-0. And they never tell us why they voted the way they did or who's responsible for whatever. Um, things happen, like, for example, they purchased... Um, seats for the stadium and they disappeared after about a year but nobody's told us where they are what happened to them so that's a question i would have and i work for the school system i don't know what happened to them thank you brett barden yeah i know transparency has been a hot button issue and it's it's really critical uh for a public uh board like the board of education to operate with transparency the last uh, three meetings held by a board of education were uh, excluding tonight was the regular board meeting uh, a work session on April 11th, and before that, it was a, a strategy session that was held. And I, I took the time to go and look at the minutes from the strategy session, and this is a meeting that happens once a year to set the direction of the school system. Uh, you know, really important topics being discussed, and, and subsequently, we, we publish a, a strategic plan. And I don't need to use very much time to read you the minutes from that meeting, which is Chair Porson called the strategic planning se uh, session to order. The board held a strategic planning session. The board agreed to adjourn the strategic planning session. That's just not enough information. And, and I mean, I realize we published the strategic plan later, but it's just as important to know what was discussed that to goes into the strategic plan and maybe what was discussed that didn't go into the strategic plan as it is to know actually what landed there. Thank you. Doug Westmoreland? Yes, I don't have enough time to respond. Let me respond first to Mr. Garrett. I know this is not a rebuttal, but I do want to say this. Uh, I don't know how we can be more transparent. Uh, one of the things I've never seen Mr. Garrett come into uh, one of our work sessions, and that's where we grind everything out. And he's never been to one. I've never seen him open the door to come to one. Now, Mr. Barden came today. He got to see firsthand sort of what goes on behind the scenes. And why not vote 5-0 for something that's good for students? Why not vote 5-0 for something that's good for uh, teachers? I mean, my goodness alive, we're, we're trying to be the best that we can be with our students and our school system. And we do disagree in the work session, but we come to a unified agreement. And that way, on the regular board meeting, we don't have people sitting out there for three hours to listen to us go back and forth, back and forth. You're more than welcome to come to a work session and hear that. Now, as far as the uh, strategic planning session, that is open to the public. That's not a closed meeting. Do you really want us to put everything on here? Do we want to spoon feed everybody, Mr. Garrett? Do we want to just bring everything to them? Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Westmoreland. Rebuttals? Yes. Uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Dr. Barron? Uh, when I first came on the board, the board met in a work session at 4 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, we had to put a smile on our face and walk out to the public who was there, to, you know, whoever was there, and pretend that we had not just come out of a horrible work session. When I was a chair... I moved the board to a Thursday night meeting. And with that Thursday afternoon, 4.30, that's the time when people can come. And it's open to everybody. And when people show up, if they want to have talked, they can. Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> Mr. Garrett. First of all, I want to say, uh, Doug, you don't need to necessarily contradict me. I'm not running against you. 
So um, secondly, when we're talking about um, transparency and openness, I just feel like that if you're open about things, you tell people how you're going to vote. You're not, and you're always not 5-0. And, and when you talk about being 5-0, then we need to know why, how you got to that decision. As, as Brett said earlier, you, you don't just come to a decision and unanimously say it without anybody knowing how you got to that decision. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Mr. Westmoreland? We're in rebuttals now. Yes, sir. Okay, first of all, Mr. Garrett, I would like to say that uh, uh, on what you just said right there, uh, when we come to an agreement, uh, we, we discuss everything. And uh, everything is open to the public. We have everything uh, visible there that they can see. They can come and ask questions. And uh, I haven't heard one positive thing that, since we've been in these debates, anything that's come from you about positiveness in our school system. Everything has been negative. You have said one positive thing about our school system. Thank you, Mr. Westmoreland. I knew this would be a fun topic. Um, <laughs> just one, one thing I'll say to rebut is that I know a lot of times the, the response is that, you know, the meetings are open to the public and the public doesn't show. But, yeah, my translation of that is that it's, it's your fault that you're not getting the information. I know that's not word for word what we're saying. But I think it's really it's incumbent upon the board to put the information out there. This is the 21st century. You know, the inter people don't expect to have to physically go somewhere to get information necessarily. So it should be publicly available where people can find it and they can find it easily. Thank you. In regard to the increasing tragedy of school shootings, would you be open to equipping teachers with guns? Why or why not? And we'll start with Ernie Garrett. Uh, thanks for asking. Um, no, I don't necessarily think we need to equip teachers with guns, um, primarily in the um, training that we've received in the past. Um, it's FBI uh, mandated training, or not mandated, but uh, specialized training. Um, the first line of the rules that they tell you to do is um, lock your doors and um, you know stay in place, and if you can't escape safely, do that. Um, I also feel like there would be a problem, especially in middle and high school, um, with teachers carrying guns. I mean, they could be overpowered by students that may have a, a reason to bring harm and don't have access to a gun. And I just don't think we need to have an opportunity to give them that firearm. Also, we've uh, done a pretty good job with our resource officer. Here's a compliment for you, Doug. We've done a pretty good job uh, hiring resource officers for all of our school systems. And I, we generally have a resource officer at the school that handles any situation that might arise. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate uh, you doing that for us. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Brett Barden. Yeah, it's a complicated issue, obviously. Um, I think it's, it's layers of protection. Uh, you know, they say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I think uh, there's a mental health crisis in our nation, and it puts a lot of stress on our counselors. So uh, supporting our counselors and to doing their jobs well is, is a huge piece uh, of safety, uh, you know, preventing this type of incident. Uh, the resource officers, again, you know, I'd say safety starts at the door. And uh, uh, Brian Kemp, as part of our, our surplus, uh, allocated over $100 million to public school safety, I believe, uh, end of last year, early this year. Uh, and, and, you know, we'd be wise to take advantage of that uh, and make sure that we're, we're well-funded on the safety side. But getting right down to the issue, I mean, if it's, if it's something that the, the leadership feels that we need to pursue, uh, I'm not necessarily opposed to it with the right controls. Um, I think Tennessee put in place uh, some uh, uh, requirements like you know, mental health, or psychological exam, uh, so many hours of training, and a, a two-lock system because the key is you know, not letting a student get access to that firearm. Thank you. Doug Westmoreland. It's a very complicated issue. Uh, this is something that's going to require the entire board and our superintendent and everything to look at the data and make sure that we do the right things. But I'll tell you this right now, we have complete faith and a great relationship with our sheriff's department. I'm looking so much to work with, uh, look, looking forward to working with uh, Sheriff Alec Crockham back there. Uh, we're gonna have a sit down table meeting with him soon. I know where he stands. He wants to continue the great relationship that we already have, and I'm excited about that. And one last thing, uh, Mr. Garrett, I know that you're not running against me, but when you say the board does this, the board does that, I'm on the board, and you're attacking the board, not just Dr. Barron. So I take offense to that, and I'm, I'm truly behind this Board of Education and every decision we stand on. Thank you. Robert Barron. 
In 52 years of talking and working with teachers and being in the conference rooms or being in the uh, break rooms, I have never heard, especially even the last few years, a teacher tell me, boy, I went to school so I could carry a gun. I think that's totally wrong, but like Doug said, you know, this, this is not just a thing that I have to worry about. It's you know something that school will system, our system will discuss if it gets to that point. But I don't think that any of our teachers, and we've got a, a healthy bunch here tonight, and I appreciate everything they do, and I know they'll their their safety. But the thing is this: I just don't see them going to school, back to school, excuse me, to take gun pistol shooting. I'm sorry, I just don't think they're wanting to do that. We've got great educators. We've got great counselors. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Responses? Ernie Garrett? Uh, yes, I just want to respond. To, I'm not attacking the board. I've never made any personal attacks or said anything disparaging among anybody. All I'm doing is bringing up how you voted and the topics that you voted on. If you don't like the way you voted, you shouldn't have voted that way. Thank you. Brett Barden? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think just on the topic of, of guns in schools, I, it certainly uh, shouldn't be our first uh, you know, primary line of defense, and we don't want to turn the teachers into Yosemite Sam. Um, but um, it is just something that in the world we live in today, it's, uh, you know, and there's a lot of chatter about it. It's just something we have to keep an open mind to. Um, and, and But safety at the end of the day is, is what's key, and we have to weigh whether it's safer to have them versus not have them. That's where the controls come into place. Thank you. Doug Westmoreland. Mr. Garrett, when you say that the board doesn't do this, they could do a better job doing that, and why do they do this, and why do they spend this, why aren't they transparent, that is an attack on the school board. Thank you. Robert Barron. Governor Kemp has done exceptionally great things to give monies to schools for safety. And we have right now a plan in place that this summer, or over the course of summer, our technology people are going to be how, you know, they're going to be putting, you know, uh, lock mechanisms on the door to keep people out, a uh, better way of knowing who came in at a certain time. There's a lot of safety things that we are looking at, and our schools are, you know, very safe and, you know, if I see something, Thank I'll, you, Dr. Barron. I'll talk about it. Thank you, Dr. Barron. The school district's budget has increased by nearly 29% 29 since 2020. What would you do to decrease the annual general fund budget? And we will start with Brett Barden. Yeah, I mean, I think our school should be well funded when we look at the uh, direction that property uh, tax value, or property values have gone and the tax that brings in. And, and I do think we have done a good job of rolling back millage rate, but in spite of that, the revenues have gone up substantially. Uh, so that plus our SPLOST and our ELOST, I mean, we should be well-funded. Uh, I'm a big believer in a zero-based budget. We hear that a lot on the county commission. And really what we mean by that is we, you know, we separate into categories what we need and what we want, and we have to prioritize what we want to get it within budget. Uh, so I think that's really key. Uh, and just, I guess, along the lines of transparency, I, I have watched other uh, Board of Education meetings and, and talking about budget, and you know, what I've seen is, is discussion, uh, this in particular was a 10, 15 minute discussion about, uh, you know, the percentage of salaries going to administrators, and, and the board felt it was worth the time to explain uh, why they felt that the, that allocation was appropriate. So I, I do think it's important to have those types of discussions in open public. Thank you. Mr. Westmoreland? Well, it's definitely a hot topic when you start talking about budget, but I want the public to realize that this uh, FY25 challenges, we, uh, the, the state is requiring us to pay $1,760 per person for our certified, $1,760 per person for our classified, and that's going to increase our board budget on over $2 million. That's something's out of our hand. That's not something that we did. And, uh, you know, I, I, when I was listening to the, uh, the county commissioners, you know, Wade Rose brought up some good points there about 
the, uh, the, the spots and the taxes and let, let our people that come into the community that visit us to help pay for some of this. That's where it is. That's where we need to have, uh, uh, and we're, and we're, we're, we're ex excited about our spots and stuff through that. But uh, one of the things too, we're gonna be paying off our schools here in the next three years and we're gonna be totally debt free. And we're excited about that. But yes, it's a, it's a hot topic, but we're gonna do everything we can to increase it. Thank you. Dr. Barron? Today was our second of three required budget hearings. We had our second one. Um, raise your hand other than us who were there. Nobody. And, you know, it's not that we haven't advertised it. We have advertised it. But in that, our CFO, greatest person in the world, Stacey Newsom, she does do a zero-based budget. And it's a, it's a budget that has been thoroughly gone through. Mr. Garrett, you were part of that administrative team at some point where you looked at the budget, you figured out what you needed, you looked at what you didn't need, and you made a contribution to that uh, session. But Ms. Newsom has, you know, plotted it out, and, and we still got another meeting to go. And I encourage you to come, because we will allow you to speak if you want to. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Garrett? I do understand it takes a great deal of money to run a school system the size of ours, but I also feel like that we need to be um, we need to be doing, you know, doing our part for the taxpayers. And so it goes back to transparency because, like I said at the forum, we have in the last five years, we've had an increase of 19.3% in the amount of money that's been received in our tax system. But yet, um, going back to what I say about school boards, how we voted, I've heard you say many times that we've lowered the taxes. No, you've lowered the millage rate, but you've not lowered it to the percentage that you have actually lowered taxes. The amount of taxes continue to go up. So I feel like we have to work within our means to keep taxes low and quit creating new jobs and quit create, uh, spending money on things that we don't necessarily need. Um, in 2015, we had uh, teachers that were furloughed for six days, but we found $3 million to redo the football field. So there's money out there when you want to do something with it. Thank you. Responses? Dr. Barron? During COVID, we, you know, we had to, you know, you know, be very careful with what we were doing with our monies. And we've had to furlough, but we've been very cautious about how we were going to do it. We have a budget system that is, you know, it's working, it's a living document. And you were part of that living document. Do you know that when you were administrator for the middle, for Dr. the Barron? alternative school? Excuse me, Dr. Barron, your time's your up. Thing. Sorry. Leaves you hanging, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, but yes, I do Fred remember Barton? when I was a principal at alternative school. Go yeah, ahead. I'm, uh, all due respect, Dr. Barron, uh, tremendous respect for this man. I stood out in his yard and talked to him on Sunday when I was out yes. on the run. So, yeah. Uh, but I just think we need to rethink our way of getting information to the, the public uh, in, in modern day times. People just, they're not going to turn up for meetings in, in person. And we spent a couple years locked up at home and, and our mindset has changed. Um, so I just think it's really important to push as much information out to the public as possible and then let them digest it. If they want, if they take issue with it, that's when maybe they'll come and, and show up at the meetings. Thank you. Any other responses? No, I'm, I'm okay. Okay. It's, it's been answered. Let okay. Go ahead and just take the opportunity to say, um, again, I don't mean to do a personal attack on anybody. I, uh, both Doug and Robert both taught me in high school. I love both you gentlemen very well, and uh, it's not anything personal, but I just think we have differences of opinions. But um, I do highly honor and respect both of you guys because you helped make me who I am, and I appreciate you doing that for me. Thank you. And this will be our last question, and then we'll go to closing statements. We'll have responses. We'll have time for responses. There has been discussion about salary increases for the administration and directors. 
Do you believe our administrators and directors are paid fairly? Why or why not? And we'll start with Doug Westmoreland. Absolutely. You pay for great leadership. We've got the best system in the state of Georgia, and you're going to pay for administrators and great leadership. We want to make sure our salaries are competitive with our area. If not, we're going to lose those people. We've got one sitting in the audience right now that went to another county because it made more money. We need to keep our great leaders here. I would like to point out something that Mr. Garrett put in the paper that said that when we compare Mr. Cooper's salary to the area systems that pay more, the systems were larger, that is a lie. I've got right here, I listed all the, uh, the things in our, in our county, uh, the, the Pioneer Risa here. Raven County pays more to their superintendent. They have a school system that has one high school, one middle school, one elementary school. They have 2,270 students. Lumpkin County has one high, one middle, one, two elementary. They only have 3,749 students, and they pay almost $40,000 more than we pay our superintendent. And then also Gainesville City, uh, Jeremy Williams, uh, Thank he you. makes more, and it's a very similar situation. So, Thank you, yes, Mr. Westmoreland. We need to keep paying. Thank you, uh, Robert Barron. A lot of times, people lose sight of the fact that teachers uh, go back to school and get a higher degree. That will cost money. Uh, they get a a increment raise, uh, one or two years, you know, every two years, and so that takes money, and. Yes, I think we do pay our folks what they deserve. I wish I could give them more, but that's not part of it. We have a good system that tries our best to pay the people, you know, what they're giving us. And look at the graduation rate. It's working. We've got good people, and look at that 97.8% graduation rate. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Ernie Garrett. Um, I do feel a lot that we need to pay for what you get, but um, you know, if a superintendent or administrator comes and says, I want more money, um, or I'll go somewhere else, well, generally, if you put, uh, post that job and it's a superintendent's job, you're going to get a lot of resumes for that. If you've got a big pot of money that you want to spend on salaries, look at where you can't find people. We can't find bus drivers. We can't find cafeteria workers. I mean, because the money's not there for them. And if you put that post that job, you don't have 50 resumes coming in looking for a new bus driver. So I think that the people that are doing those higher paying jobs, they're already compensated pretty well. And if they do leave, there's always going to be, I don't want to lose people, but if they choose not to work in, in our county, there's always an option for them to go somewhere else. But just because somebody comes and says, I want more money, and if the salary is, is a problem, why is that not discussed as a budget item and talked about at a, at a board meeting instead of just giving raises Thank to people you. without knowing it? Thank you, Mr. Garrett. And Brett Barden? Yeah, I mean, it's, it can, it's a sensitive subject, right? But we have to take it back to the fundamentals, students, teachers, taxpayers. Um, I think the administrators have an impact on students, and so they deserve to be compensated for the, the hard work that they do. I don't think that we can have a disproportionate pay increase on the administration side and not on the teacher side, because, I mean, truthfully, the teachers uh, are our most valuable asset in uh, the school system. So what I don't want to see is, is you know, ballooning administrator salaries and teachers' salaries staying stagnant. Last thing I'll say is, you know, you pay for performance. So Accountability is really key here. It's not the job of the Board of Education to run the day-to-day -day of the school, but it is important for them to hold the leadership accountable. And sometimes, you know, between the layer of the schools and the Board of Education, there's the, a leadership layer that, that can tend to filter things. I'm not, I'm not saying that they hide things, but I think it's really important to get, through anonymous surveys, the voice of the teacher, the voice of the administrator, to make sure that we can hold our, uh, our leadership accountable, and that includes the Board of Education. Thank you. Responses? Yeah, first of all, I'd like to say that I've never said that we would lower taxes. I said that the millage rate has been lowered each year. Some taxes do go down, some don't go down. It all depends on the property. Also, Mr. Garrett, when you retired, you were making over $92,000 a year with only 80 students, and we've got administrators sitting out here. I don't, I don't know how that makes them feel. But if you look at yours, you were paying about, if you break it down per student, that's about $1,853 per student. Mr. Cooper has over 7000 people and uh, students in the system. You break that down on his salary, that's about Thank $27.59 per student. Thank you. Responses? Ernie Garrett? 
I still don't see why this is a personal attack on me, Doug, because you're not running against me. You're right. You're making an attack against the board. But you are. Uh, Robert Barron. But you are running against me. And, and you're I'm, not attacking me. Uh, wait a minute. Let's um, speak one at a time. Robert Barron. Thank you, dear. Uh, but you are running against me, and I think that we do try to keep everybody aware of things. Sometimes, you know, people don't read the newspaper. Sometimes they don't have a computer. There's many things that can stop someone from actually uh, seeing what all we do. And we have a good board that works together in harmony. And I, I believe that part of it. You said your family couldn't go. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Same place. Thank you. We will begin closing statements. And since we started opening statements with Brett Barden and went down, we're going to start closing statements with Ernie Garrett and come this way. Okay. Thanks for this time. Um, I feel like we uh, have a need to have high expectations for our students. We need to support our teachers and we be, need to be accountable for taxpayers. Industry in Haversham County have told me that they want employees that will come to work and be teachable to learning new skills. If I'm elected, I will do my best to serve each of these areas. I'm Ernie Garrett, and I appreciate your vote, but most of all, I want your prayers in this election. Um, on May the 21st, I would ask that you go to the polls and vote for me, Ernie Garrett. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Barron? If you have not voted, I would appreciate your support. We have one team, one mission, and that is success for all students. The four big things that we're dealing with is safety, discipline, quality and structure, quality and instruction, and attendance. There is, this speaks volume for how we have gotten the scores, the graduation rate. We are doing well, and it's because of harmony. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Doug Westmoreland. Just want to conclude by saying that I've really enjoyed serving on the Habersham County Board of Education for the past eight years. I'm very proud of all the accomplishments that the board has enjoyed, and I make no apologies for the decisions that we've made since being on the board. I'm very passionate about being a board member, and I want to continue to serve because I want the very best for our students and our teachers. The experience that I bring to the board is important for all groups, students, teachers, administrators, and coaches. It is extremely important to have someone on the board that has the educator experience, background, and passion that I have. So therefore, Thank I would you. greatly appreciate your support and vote. Thank and you. And re-elect me for a third time on the Habersham County Board of Education. Brett Barden. Yeah, I mean, we have a great school system here. We're very blessed in Habersham County to have, uh, not the system itself, but all the people who make up the system. I want to be a part of that. I, I look forward to an opportunity. It makes me excited to think about joining a Board of Education uh, and, and learning and applying new skills there. Um, so I'm just asking that you, that you vote in new perspective, which is, is what I would bring to the board. Uh, and, and I would be looking out for the students, teachers, taxpayers. Uh, so early voting is open now. I appreciate your vote. Thank you. And this concludes our Board of Education debate. And I want to thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thank you. I would, I would also like to thank our sponsors again because we are very appreciative of their support. We'd like to thank McDonald and Cody, Piedmont University. Um, we would like to thank OBA, the Brazilian Cuisine. Um, Norton Agency, the City of Demarest, the Habersham County Republican Party, and Northeast Georgia Signs. And thank you all for coming, and please get out and vote. <laughs>